and welcome to English Club TV. I'm Ashley Jenkins. And I'm Holly Holborn, and this is our guest today, Dr. John Mitchell. We hear you had an interesting path in becoming a professor. Can you tell us about that? I can. Uh, for my undergraduate degree, I went to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, where I studied microbiology and genetics. And to help go to school, to you help know, my parents pay for school, I scooped ice cream at Baskin Robbins at yeah, 31 Flavors. I know. Rocky Road best flavor ever. And I wanted to be a medical doctor. So, you know, I, was, I studied pre-med, but med school was unimpressed that I could scoop ice cream okay. and make a shake, right? They don't, they don't care about that. So I took a job at um, a small crop genetics company to help, again, pay the bills, but this was more science. And they worked with corn and soybean and wheat and alfalfa. You know, I hoed weeds and planted seeds and, and learned about genetics at the population level from those guys. And so when I graduated, I just took a job. I didn't get into med school. I took a job. Uh, school was hard. I hated it. Um, decided to take a break. And so then the Dow Chemical Company bought our little company. Mm -hmm. And after a couple of years, they told me that I had to go get a PhD or I was fired. Oh. And that I had some potential. And so uh, they sent me to Purdue University in, in Indiana where I got a PhD. And then when I was supposed to finish, um, after six years, I got my doctorate in molecular genetics and biochemistry, plant physiology, uh, that sort of thing. I went back to Dow and, 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 and worked in a lab in project creation and learned chemistry, learned how to write patents, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, uh, things change over time and you realize that you like teaching. I was an adjunct professor at Indiana University before here and then I got an opportunity to come visit the Dakotas. And I was really excited. I had never been to South Dakota before. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I got uh, an opportunity to come visit, I, was, I held, held up a map and I was like, Mom, Mom, w you know, I'm going to go. Let's find out where it is. And we looked on the map and I was devastated. Aberdeen, I thought Aberdeen might be near Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. mm, not really. No. no. I thought maybe it's the Badlands. Just a, li a, little, a little drive. I know, right? I mean, it was a little drive. It was just relatively close. Fargo is the nearest big city. But it's close to North Dakota which is uh, God's country. Yeah, I, I so. understand. It, it is pretty up there. <laughs> yeah, it came up, but the folks were really nice and they wanted me. And so, you know, here I am in a second career. It's go. been great. It's been great. So you mentioned you worked for the company working with crops. I did. So you could say that you really hoed it up during college. I <laughs> <laughs> you could say, yes, you, you, you could. I did uh, hoed ho, 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 ho it up. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and it's okay. It's, it's, I didn't think of it like that, but yay. We discussed how you traveled from the East Coast mm -hmm. to South Dakota. Yep. We, but we know you like to travel other places do. as well. I love to travel. Where is the most interesting place you've been? Ooh, gosh. When I was uh, working for Dow, I went to a science meeting um, one time in Vienna. And, and there's lots of good places in Europe, but we were at a science meeting and I took some time away and it was during the beginning of the, of the Kosovo War, but I got stuck in the, in the subway and, and we came up and then we were right in the middle of this political protest. So there was lots of Adolf Clinton, you know, Adolf Schmidt. It was a big deal during this Kosovo War that was going on. Mm -hmm. That was kind of exciting, you know, to see political unrest and protests in a peaceful way and how things were going on in the in the Yugoslavian country. Mm -hmm. So it was that was kind of exciting. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Paris and in parts of France. Um, did you go to Versailles? I did. I, I really did. Like the Versailles I, Gardens. It's they're all really pretty. I mm -hmm. was uh, kind of partial to the Loire Valley, a little west of uh, west of Paris. We had a, a small seed company there. I got to do some science with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never been to the UK. I would love to go there. I got lost in Milan, driving on the, on the French Riviera along mm -hmm. the highway. I missed a turn and mm -hmm. got lost there, which doesn't suck. That's it's good. It's not to a bad hear. place to get lost in Florence or, or, or Milan. But I like to uh, backpack as well and, and, and do some canoeing. I think some of the, you know, bet we're in an area not too far from northern Minnesota. Is yeah, boundary waters, right? Yeah, it's beautiful mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. I met the king of Sweden. Interesting. Oh, wow. Close personal friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was in the Boy Scouts, we went to Sweden for a world jamboree once. And it was supposed to be during, it was supposed to go to Iran. Um, but this was at the same time, this will age me, but at 1977, 78 was when the Shah of Iran 
left Iran, and um, the Ayatollah Khomeini took over, and President Carter was around. You didn't start the fire? No, not at all. <laughs> we were supposed to go to Iran with the Boy Scouts, and they had been spent, you know, those poor Scouts had been working years to build a city for all of the world's uh, world Scouts mm -hmm. to come. And so then President Carter said we weren't allowed to go. And so and Carl in, uh, in Sweden, he said, hey, come to my country. And so we went there and have a picture with me, shaking his hand. He's a big Boy Scout. It was, wow, it was pretty cool. Awesome. It, was, it was pretty cool. And Sweden was That just was, sounds was like amazing. the most random place to go with the Boy Scouts. Like, it was, really but cool, he was a huge, it was huge Scouts. They were co-ed there, so that was a novelty. <laughs> yeah, that was actually quite quite fun. That was, I don't know, one of the more interesting times. You don't often get to meet royalty. Were you like a super young boy scout? I, well, I was like 14. I was like 14 at the time, so. Mm -hmm. I'm just imagining like a six-year-old boy scout no, going. No, <laughs> no, no. High school, well, I guess eighth grade. Eighth grade. That's Ninth still grade. really young. Yeah, 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 something like that. It was first time overseas, mm -hmm. so it was kind of scary, but, but fun. But Sweden, yeah. that was. It was great, you know, the countryside yeah. was wonderful. Mm -hmm. It was fun. So. Often literature complements science. Does. A famous example of this would be Charles Darwin and his origin of species. Oh, sure. What are your opinions on him as both a scientist and a writer? Oh, he, you know, he's amazing. He, you know, some trivia about, about Darwin, he, he, he got seasick all the time. He was a big horse guy and then he got put on the HMS Beagle and, and he's traveling around checking out, you know, uh, finches and tortoises and you know, traveling all over. But at that time the boats were I mean, it took years to get around South mm -hmm. America and then all the way up to the Caribbean and that on the western side. Yeah. And he, he got sick a lot. And, you know, he didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> he couldn't just snap a photo and, you know, Instagram it or whatever. So, you know, he's got his little microscope. He's taking samples. They're rowing him around. The, the ocean's rough. He's an amazing artist. Mm. Um, not impressionist, but to get the details is, is amazing. You look at some of his drawings. You know, to be able to see things and uh, observe detail and then piece them together in a big picture point of view, in, mm -hmm. a, in that kind of way, to be able to explain what's going on, take that next step. I mean, as faculty, we're always wanting our students to, okay, here's our information, now take that next step. Like the um, bottom up thinking. Yeah, be able to put it together and then broaden it. And mm -hmm. not, not stereotype or, or, or classify or pigeonhole something. But see the big picture. But yeah, be able to, you know, I don't know, observe everything in, in a way. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly we don't look as scientists as this is the law and all things must conform to this law because mm -hmm. that's, you know, that's not nature. And, yeah. and there's, there are rules and mm -hmm. to be able to sort them out and the answers are there. Sh nature wants to give us these answers. You just have to ask the right questions, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's kind of the key, and I think he asked the right questions and pieced things together and said, hey, you know what, things don't fit. Well, on the side, he's married to a woman who is extremely religious, and he knows that he's going to burn in hell when he publishes his, his origins. So he sat on that data for 20 years and waited to publish because he didn't want to upset her. He knew it was going to change the way the world is today. Mm -hmm. You know, it was going to radic. It was radical, and there would be people that say he was, you know, a horrible individual and was going to burn. And his wife was one of them. She and he didn't. She was worried about his soul. He was worried about her. And he was a sensitive man who was worried about everybody's feelings. And so he sat on this data forever. And then he finally published his data, and it, and it did cause cause heartburn. It caused a lot of controversy. His writing is descriptive. It's a it's a good read. It's long. Yeah. It's a little too long. Maybe, uh, <coughs> but you know, to describe everything that he had, I think what's more amazing is to have the I don't know the guts, the power, you know, to to believe in something that you have found and know that even though it's going to go against popular thought, you're still going to follow through and do it. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Especially for that. I mean, not just that time, but we're living a time now too. So for somebody to stand up, what they really believe, not just fashion or trendy. Mm -hmm. But like deep down to the core, that's you know that's it. That's 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 what we all strive for, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's ever, pretty cool. Do you ever read Origin of the Species? I haven't or read it for a long classes? time. I, I, we do not. You know, most of the students we, today reading over a thousand pages is, would be hard mm -hmm. for us to get through. I read that in my undergraduate. Sometimes we'll, I'll I'll put snippets out. 
you know, maybe a few pages or something along those lines or illustrations or highlight a few paragraphs on this page or that page, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, to get them to read the whole thing would be impossible. I, I don't know if it's impossible, but it would be hard. It would be a lot it, to ask. It would be. A, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I guess if I went into biology, I would be like, I did not sign up <laughs> to read a thousand pages. Exactly. You would if be I upset, would, I would right? want to be, a, you wanna do be stuff. an English major. <laughs> yeah. You, well, you want to do stuff. But, it, it, you know, if you wanted to read, you know, I don't know, The Sound and the Fury, and you say, okay, that's one. But what if I said, okay, the reading list is, we're going to read one each week. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, uh, okay, mm -hmm. what do I do? It's like seminars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, thank gosh for Spark Notes or, 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 or Cliff Notes, or, or mm -hmm. I could just read Wikipedia and get the synopsis of the story. Yeah. yeah. But you're but missing you're so much. You you're missing so yeah. much. Part, I think, one of the, the things that we, we do a little of that. Dr. Kiso uses books in her classes. We were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, reading, you know, a novel or reading you know, some selected writings of, of people, non, they're scientists, but they're non-science folks mm -hmm. writing about science. And so it's, it's kind of fun to bring other, other disciplines into the, into the classroom. I, I find that interesting. I think you guys might find it interesting to mm -hmm. get a mm -hmm. little bit of both. The problem is maybe you don't have the foundation to really grasp, you know, Mendel's concepts or Darwin in that way. Mm -hmm to talk about evolution, you can't not talk about the origin of species. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about, you know, Lamarck's viewpoints a little earlier or, or, uh, or some of the, the, con the, the essays on intelligent design. You know, the blind watchmaker principle is a common, I don't know, analogy story where, you know, there's no way that that blind watchmaker can make a watch with all the intricate springs and coils and twists and cogs and, to you know, I mean, it's just mm -hmm. too precise. Uh, how could random nature of, of Charles Darwin make my eye, mm -hmm. you know, or make something as intricate as, as that? Mm -hmm. You say, well, that has to be some other, well, I don't know, you know, intervention, a god or, or an alien or something, mm -hmm. right, in some kind of intelligent design we don't understand yet. Yeah. So it's kind of a fun, it's, it's fun to talk about those kind of things and then bring everything home with, with some scientific fact, I think. To me, what's most interesting is the big picture. Mm -hmm. And Charles Darwin's stuff really hit, it hit everything. It hit culture, it hit science, it hit, um, so man's amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and to this day, you know, people argue about him. Which yeah. is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Plus he's buried. Wh where is it? West Westminster Abbey? Isn't isn't he buried I'm next unsure. to Aristotle or somewhere up there? I don't have a good transition for this one. Oh, that's okay. But you you're a fan of transcendentalism. I, I like right? that. Yeah. <laughs> we 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 kind of were talking about it a little bit. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were wondering since you're also a biologist. Uh -huh. Would you consider moving to Walden Pond and living there for a <laughs> it year? It would be pretty cool, like wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. or, or just out in the Montana someplace where there's not, not a lot of people. Um, yeah, I spent most of my life in, in, in big city, south of Boston. My parents lived mm -hmm. not too far from in a town called Situate, but it's close to Dorchester where Goodwill Hunting uh, oh, okay. was in that area. It's gotcha. kind of a rough area of Boston. And, mm -hmm. and then we moved, you know, to Illinois, you know, Central Illinois, South Chicago, that area I went to the Big Ten. So mm -hmm. I think Illinois has like 50 some thousand students and Purdue same and you know, a professor at IU, there's another 50,000. So big, yeah. big, big, I worked in Indianapolis. So I wanted a little off the grid here. You know, I, Aberdeen, a lot of people would say is kind of off the grid, but yeah. it's still not off the grid. It would be nice to get one with nature, right? To just kind of yeah. disappear. I like that. It allows me to, I don't know, process things, chew on it a little bit, think about what's going on, ask. Reflect. Why? Yeah, kind of. What? Mm -hmm. What's what's going on in the past, and what what can I do in mm -hmm. the future? What's going on around me? What? Because everything is fitting, especially in science. You know, it's there's not just one straightforward path. It's it's not a food chain, but a food web. Everything is dependent on everything else. Mm -hmm. You mess up one little thing over here, then all that puts everything else out of whack. So, mm -hmm. yeah, in a heartbeat. Now, Walden Pond, uh, uh, that area is nice. That area is nice. 
I like that. I think if I was in that time period, I would be into that club. <laughs> the <laughs> it's transcendental kind of, club. It's kind of a club. But then, yeah. it, then again, you know, I think maybe you take it a little too far and become kind of, I don't know, lazy, you know. Yeah, Emerson really set out the rules with nature and he theorized the way you should live right. in transcendentalism, but like Thoreau. He took it a little bit, like a little he, radical. He did. He was a little, he, I mean, he was kind of a radical dude. His, his opinions are, you know, yeah. he, if you didn't think like he did, mm -hmm. I got the impression he was not like interested in you. <laughs> yeah. And then you go even further with Whitman. Mm -hmm. I'll say, right. no, I, I <laughs> love Walt Whitman. I have a copy. It's I a it's a facsimile, uh, but it's of Leaves of Grass. It's one of oh, my favorites, yeah. and it is beautiful. It's a, it's in leather. It, it's beautiful. It's a uh, from collector's reprints. Mm. Uh, it's amazing, and his, his poetry is, is it's kind of cool. But mm -hmm. to, to I think all scientists are a little like this. You know, now you could be analytical. You could think like math people. You know, there's, but I think if you want to really ask the big picture questions, you need to be able to blend all these concepts together. Yeah, and I think a lot of people from different areas can think in, I mean, not all science majors or math people are analytic, they are creative thinkers. Mm -hmm. And it's just using your interest in that, in that creative way, like a lot of, I would say I'm a very analytical person and I'm an English major, but I can be creative sometimes too. So. Well, and I think English is about being analytical too because mm -hmm. you have to analyze things and kind of ask questions while you're reading. So I think mm -hmm. you, it's interesting to see how all of these disciplines kind of work together. Yeah. I know, and, and, and you wish you could see that earlier. Mm -hmm. I think the sooner you can, you can get those, those messages from the different yeah. disciplines, then you can blend them quicker and then you can really get some bang for your buck. Yeah. You can really enjoy your classes mm -hmm. more. Yeah. You, you can get a lot out of it, a lot more, when you can piece these things together. I mean, you, you mentioned being an analytical, and you think, okay, I, but that just doesn't mean I'm, I should be an accountant. Right. And I only deal with numbers and just give me the facts, bullet point everything. Yeah. I don't give me the details. You know, I'm mm -hmm. just about that quick, quick hitting. USA Today, whatever, you know, yeah. just the facts, man. Yeah, going back to like boxing yourself in. Yes, exactly. But being an analytic doesn't necessarily mean, you know, dot the I, cross the T, font size, margin, you know, those, the metrics, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know. You, uh, the, I, there's a special place for those people. It, it, it is not me. Yeah. I, I, I find that mind numbingly boring. Oh, mm -hmm. And it just kills me mm -hmm. to have to conform to font size it, if that's the question mm -hmm. that you're going to ask me about well, i could write a paper about this book mm -hmm. and how it relates to biotechnology he's mm -hmm. like okay great what's the font size what what how what are the margins what how many paragraphs do you want how many pages you want oh my God. yeah that will drive me crazy because mm -hmm. i'm more big picture details kill me now well, you have to be a detailed yeah. person to be a scientist mm -hmm. so it's kind of it, it's a constant contract. It's yeah. a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's a Jekyll and Hyde, you know, kind of. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh. I'd argue that you have to be a little creative, yeah. at least to be a scientist that discovers anything new. I would think so, right? Yeah. 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 Because you can't really. I'd imagine <laughs> Darwin would have to have been at least sort of creative. Yeah. To have even thought to look at these changes right. yeah. and thought to create But you could look, he theories. was prepared. And, and, and now, you know, you look at Louis Pasteur and his famous quote that you see all over this, chance favors the prepared mind, mm -hmm. right? So if you're ready for an opportunity, you know, the signs everywhere. Yeah. How many times do you walk down the, you're driving down the road, you're walking down the street, whatever, walking on the green. Did you see the sign? Maybe you missed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. You know, and that's why mm -hmm. those opportunities and regret is the worst, right? That's got to be like the worst. That's got to be the worst thing ever, right? Yeah. I mean, is to, oh, I wish I would have went left instead of right. right. I wish Knowing I you missed an opportunity. Not had said this or, or, or said this or, mm -hmm. or spoke my mind or did a little better or that's, that's brutal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that just, that mm -hmm. just uh, I think that would gnaw and rot. Yeah. <laughs>